I think a lot of people get caught up like, well, I want to do this now, I want to do this now. And it's like, okay, cool, you're doing this now, but what about you? But I know a lot of people say like getting 100K is the hardest part. For me, that was not the hardest part at all. That was probably one of the, that was probably one of the easiest ones, actually. Getting my 100K was probably one of the easiest. But I did have three hiccups and 10K was definitely to me the hardest was getting over 10K. Make, a, make something happen. Make a way, you know, you know. Get out that same position. Is it hard? Yes, it's not supposed to be easy. If it's easy, you're not going to value it. Go through that struggle. Everyone has to go through that struggle to come forth this pure gold. And it feels, it feels good to know that, to just be like, man, you know, I can... I can buy this, that, this, that, you know. It feels good to just be able to know that. Most people see buildings and stuff. I see money. I see, you know, the matrix glitches going over my eyes and all I see is green, <laughs> I see money. I see where can I put, I'm looking to say, where can I put my money in that? So wherever I see the most stuff making the most money, I want to look into it and see how can I capitalize off that too. Around 90K or something like that. The market, every, I was throwing everything but the kitchen sink at the market i put money in there 92 come back the next day 89 come back 86 and i'm just keep throwing money in and money keep going down and i'm just like oh man i'm never gonna get over 100k if anything i guess that's more what it is you gotta want success investors welcome back to another go round of masters of the market now this week I am incredibly excited to have on with me Andre Stewart. He goes by Andre the Titan. Now, I got to be honest, Andre sent me an email sharing a brief snippet of his story, and I could not help but invite him on. He went from zero to six figures and all about three years. I wanted him to share his story with all of you, but here to do just that, Andre, I'm going to pass it over to you with this first question. What exactly is your story? How'd you get to where you are today? Uh, I've started... I want to say right by uh during COVID, I was on a I was actually on my phone. I'm playing a game on my phone, a little airplane game, and I keep getting these, obviously I keep getting these ass that keep popping up. So the first set I kept getting was about acorns. So eventually I looked into it. I said, well, let me, I said, because I kept getting the ass. I, said, I got tired of getting them. I said, look, let me just go look into it and see what it is. So I looked into that, and then when I looked into that, something else popped up um when it said seven out of ten Americans don't have a thousand dollars in a banking account. And I felt like when I heard that I had an out of body experience where it's like everything was looking at me like, well, really, I don't have a thousand dollars. I didn't have pretty much anything. So I ended up dipping inside acorns, looking into it and doing that for a little bit. And from there, I kind of didn't like acorns a bit because of the fees and all that as I continue to do a little bit more research on it. So I was looking for another investment platform, which I came across Robin Hood. And um once I found Robin Hood, I think from there it was more about me just trying to understand it and navigate about what is a stock. And I guess I was clueless on everything. I didn't know anything. So me and I was just trying to figure out exactly what everything is. So it just took a lot of research of finding out. And also, too, I think, too, what intrigued me was just me trying to find out what the heck is a dividend is. Because I remember when I got paid <laughs> on Acorn, going back, like, is they going to pay me every day? They're going to pay me every week? So I think I was trying to find that same thing on Robin Hood. And then once I got that first um, dividend, that was 12 cents, I just got addicted. I just found it hard to believe that a company is going to pay me just to hold on to their stock. And from there, it was like, okay, if they could pay me 12 cents, then that means I can get $100. So from there, I think that's where the addiction kind of started as far as me just saying, I want to get as much as possible. I love it. It started, I mean, it sounds like really humble beginnings in terms of like you figured out you were one of those seven uh, out of 10 Americans <laughs> without a thousand dollars. Yeah, I did get the thousand dollars first. That was the first thing I did. I did get the thousand dollars first. Then I went ahead and started <laughs> start, the, start the whole investing. So I want I want to get like a full picture scope here, just as beautifully and as elegantly as you sent that email to me. What yeah. were you doing in terms of work? Like when when you saw that uh you know ad and, and it got you into acorns, mm -hmm. what what did your life look like at that point in time? What were you doing and how did you start saving like how did you just make that switch after seeing that ad so i think so one thing i think me being um i don't know if it's just a mind thing but i guess for me probably being in fitness it was more like it's either i'm going to do it or i'm not and once i seen that i didn't that switch just it switched instantly and it was like okay well first let's get a thousand dollars first and what i was doing i was working in pharmaceuticals which i work in the pharmaceutical industry now still um, just higher up the chain. And um, I think for me, I just had to look at where the heck was all my money going. And when I looked, it was just like, it was going nowhere. It was just, it was just 
I know it sounds crazy, but it was just disappearing. So the first thing that I did was I went and got a calendar and I marked down from one to 30, each bill that's coming out, how much money I make, how much I got left over afterwards. And from there, I said, okay, well, I'm gonna cut out buying anything that's gonna be something I'm not gonna use. Something that I want, I don't need. Something I need, I'm gonna get. And then from there, I said, okay, well, I got this much to invest. I did put a little bit in at the time because at the same time, I'm nervous. Just I don't know what I'm doing. You know, sure. um, I'm giving my money to Robin Hood. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to lose this money. I don't know if I'm going to get anything back. You know, so the nervousness was up in there, too. But as I continue to research, like what a stock is, dividend companies, high yield, because I was chasing high yield at first. I'll admit that um, I start putting my money into there. And then once I see money coming back, I said, OK, well, I can put a little bit more. And then eventually put a little bit more than getting raises at work, um, started a second job. I said, okay, well, I want to put all that towards whatever I can to keep throwing more money at it to help it grow faster. I got to ask, Andre, a lot of people, like you'll hear Dave Ramsey thrown around a lot. Yeah. And a lot of people get their ideas to save and then to move on to investing from someone like him or YouTubers or reading books. How did you know to, you know, before you got invested with that thousand, right? How did you know to, okay, let me get a calendar out. Let me start marking up the days of the bills. Did that, was that just like intuitively or did you, did you pick up a book and start reading about finance first? I didn't read nothing about finance. Honestly, me doing that was just, I guess for me, it was just logical to find out. Like, well, if I got these bills, I should write them down. That was just the logical answer that I, you know, that I can come up with. I didn't follow any Dave Ramsey. I did listen to a couple of his like shows and stuff, but I didn't really follow his pattern of things as far as what, you know, what he believes. Um, I just kind of said, I'm going to just try my best to do it the way I am. I'm just going to take a leap of faith and do it my way. I love it, man. I love that. That's a part of your story. Cause you, I mean, you crushed it, right? <laughs> then yeah, the day, it's like, you I didn't, did. you didn't go anywhere for that advice. It's just, it was there and you, you started doing it. Yeah, it was all that. It was, it was YouTube. Um, it was me looking at like tip ranks, me watching tip ranks in the morning it was me going on marketbeat.com. It was wallstreetzen.com. It was um, investorobserver.com. It was it was all these different websites. I just kept looking at whatever I can. But I just told myself, I'm not going to buy any, I'm not going to buy any courses. Because of course you run into stuff that's like, hey, buy this, learn this, and put money towards this. And I just said, I, I'm not going to buy anything. If anything, I'm going to do everything myself. And if I can't get it, which some websites give you like, hey, get a subscription, then that's fine. I go on a company website and get the same information. You know, sure, sure. So at this point in time, I mean, we're a little, I want to say three, four years into investing. Um, This would be my fourth year. Yeah. Fourth year. fourth year. And what type of investor at this point in time would you consider yourself? If I had to ask you, Andre, what what type of investor are you? Right now, I would say, I, I would say half and half. Um, Right now, I'm only rolling with like nine. I got just nine stocks right now. I call my bully stocks that I'm rolling with right now. Okay. Um, but beside, I can let you know that too. If you want to, if you want to know that. <laughs> we're we're about to get into the portfolio, the portfolio okay. makeup, I'll the process. You know okay. <laughs> but uh, uh, but right now I would say I'm, I focus more on I want to say growth and dividend. I'll say growth and dividend. I'm kind of mixed in between because I'm seeing certain things grow and I'm liking that too. And two, I am coming down in that yield a bit. I like to have my yield around three or four percent to be safe. I do got some five to sixes that I trust that I'm, I'm really into that's been doing nothing, but just giving me some, some, a lot of good returns. Sure. But other than that, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at now compared to when I was in the beginning, the beginning, I was just completely just high yield. I remember writing out a paper and everything, 12%, 10%. I'm like, Hey, I'm buying it. I'm buying that. I'm buying that. And <laughs> that did, that did, that bit me in a butt a bit. I'm not gonna lie. You know, so it, I'm still it, kind of at that a little bit trying to, you know, turn over the return on just one stock. But other than that, I mean, everything else, I pretty much ended up selling and kind of downsizing a bit. Sure, sure. I feel like the yield chasing happens to the best of us, especially in the beginning. I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a quick second. I want to ask you, though, right now for all of us watching and listening in here, what's the total value of your portfolio? Total value? Total value. Yeah, you could ballpark it if you don't have it off the top of your head. Uh, a little under 120k right now. Okay, 120,000 roughly. About three years to accomplish it. 
A lot of people do that in five to seven years. So you've really done a standout job. And I want to get into now the, the breakdown of your portfolio. So you already kind of went there. And I'd love to know how you started off building that portfolio. And then I guess it's now it's been a three-year journey. So kind of what happened in that three years that made you pivot a little bit, cut down on a lot of the, the holdings that you had, and now you're working with seven? I'm working with just, so I got, I call them my bully gang stocks. So it's just nine of them. Nine of so them. I'm, I still got other stocks that I'm putting money in, but these nine I'm putting the most money in at the moment. Okay. So how many holdings are in your portfolio right now? Wow. Over a hundred. Over a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> But now you're <laughs> you're you're heavily focused on nine, yeah. Yeah, but this is the thing though. I have over a hundred in there, but I only have about eighty. Oh, I think it's like eighty-seven of them that I do reoccurring that I put money in every week. So okay. I got and I'm able to pretty much flourish all of these at the same time. So it's not something where it's like I manage my portfolio. Like I'm 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 managing everything exactly well. That's how I got here. So sure. <laughs> I know some people be like, hey, that's a little too much. You know, I've heard 20, 40, you know, I like all these companies. I'm not even gonna lie. You know, at one point it just became an addiction where I just kept buying and buying and buying. So sure. Also have the best of us, man. It's a, a dividends are an addiction for me as well. <laughs> yeah, so that's what it was. And um, I know in the beginning I was pretty much just, man, I was buying everything. You name it. If it paid a dividend, I was buying it. And I just continuously kept doing that. And I did kind of find myself that I had a problem where it was like, why do I need to buy this if I got the same company? You sure. know, and it was like, I just kept, it, it was an addiction. And, and at one point I had to really just stop myself and be like, hey, look, I need to kind of calm down a bit. And I did kind of sell off a bit. And even too, like after I reached the six figures, I told myself, once I reach six figures, I'm going to go over my portfolio real quick and I'm going to just, um, I'm going to revise it. Stuff I don't need, I'm going to go ahead and let go and I'm going to get other stronger companies, even if that means lower yield, higher growth. And that's exactly what I did too as well. Sure. Do you have ETFs in there at all or is it just yeah. purely uh, individual stocks? Well, yeah, we got ETFs in there too. Um, I think I got about nine or 10 ETFs. We like the pro shares. The pro shares are awesome to me. Those are, those have just been turning wonders. That via BYMI. Um, just a couple of internationals. Um, definitely got the SCHD. Everyone, I think everyone probably pretty much has that. That's like <laughs> at the moment. So I do put a lot of money into that too. But Did you, so a lot of a lot of investors, at least me, I started off building like this ETF position because I was pretty conservative when I first started off. I'm okay. curious for you, did you start with individual stocks or did you start individual. with ETFs? I didn't get into ETFs and probably after a year I was into it, honestly. I was just 100% stock heavy. And I was going hard too. Um, I just didn't. I ain't gonna say I didn't care, but that was the young side of not knowing anything about investing, not knowing like, hey, you should get ETF, hey, you should get a growth stock. I didn't know about that. Like I look back and I remember when like Amazon did a stock split at a hundred dollars. I looked at that and said, Hey, no dividend, I'm out, I'm not doing it. Now I look back, they're trading around 170, and I'm like, that's that's money loss, you know. Sure. Now I'm curious to know, uh, and and you also shared you got a little bit a uh, chunk of change. I think you said about one percent in Bitcoin as well. Yeah. So yeah. it it's definitely it sounds like you got growth, you got the dividend. You're a lot, you're dividend heavy. It sounds to me. Uh, yeah. And then you have your ETFs. Can you walk us through some of those nine stocks that you have? Uh, what what stocks are they? The nine that you focus on, and roughly how much per week are you putting in, and what, kind of what's your process with these nine? Okay, so it's uh, Apple, uh, Syncora, uh, Hershey, Amazon, CME, Microsoft, Visa, McDonald's, and Lowe's. Those are the nine that I'm rolling with. Those are the most that I'm putting the most money in. Right now, I want to say I'm probably putting in about close to probably $300 a week or so into each of them or so like that. So sure. I kind of got everything kind of like the way Robinhood, which I like about Robinhood, is the reoccurring divot, the reoccurring money can come out it comes out on monday but i get everything paid on tuesday so i get the alerts like hey everything's been taken out everything's been paid and um i know i'm invested i know each week i'm probably putting in about 750 bucks or more each week i know i'm basically investing over three thousand dollars a month a little bit over three thousand dollars that i'm just i'm just i'm just gonna continue to put it in there you know i want it to explode so 
what what it. what led you to these companies you know because a lot of the times you know it's it happened to me you know i didn't know where to begin so that's why i started with etfs and then the next question was like well i want to get into individual stocks and so i started basically looking around at what i used but i'd love to know like how I, and i know you said you kind of went crazy with just buying a lot of stocks yeah how did you pick these nine and why these nine um, I picked these nine just me looking at, I guess for me, um, I just, I'm looking at what everyone's buying. I'm driving home. I'm seeing McDonald's always packed up. I'm seeing that f finance is never going away. So for me not to invest in Visa, everyone's using Visa, especially during the hard times. So I know it sucks, but I'm capitalizing off of everyone else too. As far as Hershey, I mean, everyone likes chocolate, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and then to me, like, I got an Android. Most people that I know, everyone has iPhone. So I'm rocking with iPhone. And then Microsoft, yeah, I was, I was kind of skeptical on that at first because I felt like I got in late. I got in like around the $250 mark, but right now it's over $400, which is good. But just seeing the moves that Microsoft is making, um, seeing me, that was a new company that I kind of just researched. Um, I think, I forgot how that one even fell in my lap. I think I was just probably just doing some research on the computer and I ran into that one. So I went ahead and went with them too. As um, far as Syncor, I work with them at work. That's a drug distributor who works with, as um, far as like pharmaceutical drugs. And I got on them early. And obviously me being in the pharmaceutical industry, I'm watching all these health drugs that I'm moving like crazy. So I feel like I kind of had an advantage there. But even the way my mindset work is, when I go outside and I'm driving downtown, most people see buildings and stuff. I see money. I see you know, the matrix glitch is going over my eyes and all I see is green. I see money. I see where can I put, I'm looking to say, where can I put my money in that? So wherever I see the most stuff making the most money, I want to look into it and see how can I capitalize off that too. And it's just worked perfect doing that. Now I, I love, I mean, everything you just described driving down the road, you got that matrix vision coming on, you know, and it's just like, you're, you're looking for money, right? You, you see money, you're looking for money. And I feel like most likely in your story, it didn't always, it didn't start there. So I, I want to figure out, you know, how did you go from a hundred plus positions and just throwing money everywhere? And now you got down to just these, these nine that you're running with. Can you talk to us about some of the lessons learned? It sounds like you may have had a lot of lessons learned in the last three years. Some yeah. of the lessons learned you've had from just, you know, throwing a lot of money into the market and kind of trialing and erroring to where you are now, where it seems like you're very systematic in, in running on a process. I think in the beginning, it was more like, I just wanted to, I guess for me, like the Warren Buffett statement of just getting a hundred K, I think that's more of what I was at. And I, and I kind of knew too, like once I reached a hundred K over a hundred K, I was going to downsize or revise my portfolio. And of course I was just kind of just, like I said, I was chasing high yield, just getting whenever I can. And then once I reached a hundred K, I sat back and I said, okay, let's downsize. Let's, let's get smart about stuff now. And I kind of found like I did have some stocks that I didn't need, stuff that was just a little crazy to have. And um, a lot of things too. And two, I just, I guess with my money, I want to be able to focus. I want to downsize so I can kind of grow a little bit of these. I want to be able to grow a lot of these other uh, stocks that I had, kind of like the Hershey's, kind of like the Amazon when I went ahead and bought that. I guess I want to grow them out a little bit more. And two, like me just looking at these companies are making a lot of money. So why not go for the big dogs? As far as lessons learned, I would think just over time of me just becoming maturing as an investor, I think that's more of what's putting your money in the right spots. Um, not saying that these other companies was bad spots, but I would just say putting it in something that is going to make you a little bit more money and a little bit more growth. And I think me too, I started to trend more towards growth um, rather than divot in a little bit. I don't know how that happened. It's just... It just kind of sort of happened where it was just like, hey, you know, I'm starting to like these stocks a little more. I'm starting to watch these stocks make moves. And then two, just watching the fluctuation of things go up. And I'm just like, I want to be part of that growth when it goes up. And just looking at like the dividend kings and uh, the increases of dividends of them paying it uh, yearly increases. I think that's more of what caught my attention of me just saying, okay, let's be smart. This stock is obviously not growing anymore. They're just paying a dividend and they're just holding it there. You know, that's not something I want. So sure. I think I kind of came from that position where it was just, and then I think mentally too, I started to grow as an investor. That's what it was too. I started to 
research companies a little bit more, do more thorough research on it too, and kind of read what the company is about instead of just going at it and just throwing some money at it. Because I would definitely say that during my journey, I was really lucky because I could have lost a lot, a lot of money the way I was just throwing money in. So out of everything that I was throwing my money at, I probably only had over the hundred stocks I threw my money in. I only had about two or three bad ones that I say I actually lost money on. So, and it wasn't even that much money. It was no more than like five, six hundred dollars loss. So I definitely say like I kind of got on the lucky end the way I was investing. Hey man, we've had people on Masters of the Market that lost five, ten k, twenty k. Yeah, and, I've heard uh, that they, <laughs> they had a real bounce back for you. I mean, really got lucky five hundred dollars here or there. Yeah. I feel like that really happens to to almost everybody, you know, from time to time. Yeah. Now, I, I want to just ask you, okay, across the board, we have for Masters of the Market, a yeah. broad audience, anyone from a beginner investor to someone who's more experienced. And just given the nature of how you started to where you're at now, really, I mean, zero to six figure and from someone who had no idea what he was doing to now very methodical with the process, yeah. Andre, where would you recommend or advise or suggest someone really starts whether they're new or perhaps they have a year or two in they're not seeing the success that you've been seeing that's a really good question i was thinking about that one time too i was like where would i tell somebody to start at um this is what i would say um i would say this think outside think logically about a lot of things look at what's moving in the world and like i said like for instance Procter & Gamble, women are always going to have a monthly cycle every month. That's never going to stop long as the world is going. Procter & Gamble is probably not going anywhere. Invest in that. Diapers, um, like I said, Hershey, you know, um, Amazon, Walmart. Just look at some of these companies. Just look around, I guess, just look outside of the box a bit and really, really look at these companies and look at how certain stuff is moving. Um, another thing that I did too was um, I went on a Fortune 500 and said, okay, what's the top 10 companies? Research all 10 of those companies. You can invest pretty much in all 10 of those companies. And two, look at it for the last past 10 years. You're going to see a lot of minimal movement. That exactly tell you exactly what to invest into too. And two, do a lot of research. Look on, you know, go, go on Google and type in and look at um, some, look at, like I used to look up like best dividend stocks to invest in, best growth stocks to invest in. And also too, not to say like you can't go on YouTube because you can, but I used to go on uh, YouTube and look at some of these um, other people that's investing too and just see what they're doing too. And I know like one good one was like dividend income. I used to watch him. Did you have Jason Fieber on here? Jason Fieber was the first one. Yeah. When I, you know, he was definitely someone that I looked at too. And another thing too is as I start to go on, I start to see stuff that he talked about that I already, already had. And that's what I said. Okay, well, I guess I'm on the right path. But yeah, from a beginner's point of view, I would just say start with a little bit of money because it is nerve wracking and just kind of look around you, kind of look at what's going on. But I'm saying certain stuff that's not going away. Like for instance, here in Wisconsin, we got wind energies. There's no competitor. Why are you not investing in that? That should be a no brainer. Easy. You know, um, Get that. I mean, that'd be easy, good start. You know, look at McDonald's. McDonald's ain't going nowhere. Probably they'll probably be the last ones to leave, even if it was apocalypse or something like that. But <laughs> <laughs> you can see the golden arches. <laughs> yeah, you're still gonna see the golden arches. They're, they're still gonna be there. But there's certain companies that you look at, and I'm not gonna say that it can't happen, but these would be the last resource to go, you know. And then health, healthcare, health is never people are always gonna get sick. Healthcare is never going away. Boom, healthcare, finance, energy. It's, to me, it's a no brainer with, with a lot of those companies. Oil, I mean, I just think there's certain stuff that, and that's why I say, like, I would tell someone to think logically to be like, just think about what you see out here and what you can really get your hands into. Cause that's kind of how I looked at it. And that's how I kind of start navigating even better when I just start thinking outside the box. It's great, man. It's, I mean, really great advice. Uh, for for anyone, uh, whether you're trying to pivot or just get started. Now, you also shared right from the get go. You know, you said you were chasing yield in the very beginning, and then you said at, at a certain point in time, there was a, a switch that was you know no more yield chasing. Right. What happened? What was that switch? How'd you you know what was the change of mind? And 
why is chasing yield a, a bad idea? Chasing yield was a bad idea because I found myself losing value in this stock. And then it's like, they're paying me a dividend. But at the same time, when I look at my returns, there's no returns on that. And the returns are just going down. And then two, there were, there were a lot of companies that I saw that was trading like around $100, 80 something dollars. And then of course, I know like when you don't have that much money, it kind of shies you the way to be like, well, I don't want to really buy like $10 of a company and get a fractional share and have to kind of, because it, it takes a while to build that up, you know? Sure. So I think that part too. And then two, I remember where um, the market actually went down again. I remember after COVID, I know the market took a little bit dip again. And that's when I was able to buy some of the companies I looked at. And I was like, okay, well, let me go ahead and get Abby. Let me go ahead and get Syncor, uh, which was ABC at the moment. But a lot of those companies I was, I was able to get. And me just doing research on those companies too. I think that's kind of what switched it. But I think the mature growth of me just watching other people as far as on YouTube too, talk about growth a bit, maybe kind of do a little bit of research on growth and knowing that even though a stock does cost a lot and they're paying us a little bit smaller of a dividend, they're trying to actually grow that company. So that could actually be a good thing on the end if you want to sell it, that stock too. So I think that's more where I came from when I started to say, okay, well, let me start going towards these smaller yield, more growth. And I think it was just a growth thing within myself too. It's like, I didn't, you know, I started to do a lot of research and I started to see people talk about a lot of these high yields and they were traps too. And I think that's what kind of turned me away a bit. So if I knew this in the beginning, I definitely think I'd have reached my journey a little bit faster. And I'd have definitely put way much more money in the beginning too as well to get there even faster. But I think that's more of what it was that kind of made me not look at it no more as far as the high yield. And how did you get to to rendering a, a three to four percent dividend yield as your sweet spot? It's also my sweet spot. I'm just curious to know how you got there as well. Um, I don't know. I, <laughs> I think I, <laughs> I just kind of was like, I think I was just like, um, I don't, I definitely don't. I mean, I'm not to say I don't like one or two, but I'm like one or two is a little low. Three or four is pretty good. Um, five six is kind of the high end. Anything after six, I'm like, oh, I don't too much care. about. Well, but I think just kind of fell in, I guess I just kind of fell with like, so three or four, you know, and then two, look at that, what most companies pay. Most companies are around that one to 9%. And I just said, okay, well, I definitely want to stay a little bit more towards growth a bit. So let me stay in between three and sure. four. And a lot of companies too, that I was looking at as far as two in my bully stocks, some of them too were 3%, 4%. I said, okay, I can rock with this. This is something I can definitely use. So I think that's kind of just fell in my lap. Sure. And, uh, I, I just yeah. finished reading uh, this book. It's called Start With Why, uh, a phenomenal read. And it, you know the, the author had shared that a true leader always has a gut feel. And it sounds like he had a gut feel on, on three to 4% of a dividend really? yield. <laughs> so, I like that. I like that. That's what it was, really. It's just, I just said, hey, this is what I'm going to roll with. It sounds, I, like I said, that gut feel and it's intuitive thought. Uh, yeah. and, and But it also, you know, talking about leadership, a lot of leaders are fearless. And from what I hear from your story, you've been pretty fearless and relentless in terms of investing. And I want to know, you know, how, how can one of us out here, right, get the, that fearless mentality when it comes to the stock market? Because oftentimes, I mean, you said right after COVID, the market dipped again. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people pulled back, pulled out of the market, you know, and didn't want to invest anymore. Some people were still teeter tottering on the edge of their seat. Should I get in? Should I not? not yeah. in a down market. Andre, how exactly do we overcome our fear and get invested? That's a good question too. And I have to say, like I use fitness towards this and I'm like that, but just like when you're down in fitness or you're in a, in a, in a competition or a race, it's like, do you give up or do you just finish and keep going? And when I look at the stock market, I guess for me, it was like, hey, this company's not going bankrupt. They're just down. Why not buy now and then it's going to end up going up again? But I think it was just more of a, you just got to take a leap of faith. Honestly, you just got to put like this. A lot of people waste a lot of money doing crazy stuff. You just got to be able to be willing to risk that money to say, hey, if I lose it, cool. If I don't even, you know, if I don't lose it even better. But the mindset part, that's kind of hard because you just got to, you just got to, just got to have it. I know it's kind of hard to say, but you just got to have, you just got to be, you got to want success. 
if anything, I guess that's more what it is. You got to want success. And what comes with success is risk. Um, what comes with success is um, doing something, I guess, doing something you never done before to get something you never had before. That was my model when I said, okay, I'm going to just go ahead and just put more money in. Or even too, like, I remember when I got around 90, well, around 90K or something like that, the market, every, I was throwing everything but the kitchen sink at the market. <laughs> I put money in there, 92. Come back the next day, 89. Come back, 86. And I'm just <laughs> keep throwing money in and money keep going down. And I'm just like, oh, man, and I'm never going to get over 100K. And I just kept throwing money in, just kept throwing it in. And then eventually... Once the market settled, boom, you know, you was right over your goal or you right by your goal. So I would say just, you just got to take a leap of faith. You just got to trust the process. You're giving money to your 401k every, you know, every week or every two weeks, you know, you're not worrying about that money. So do the same thing for yourself. That's powerful. Really powerful. I want to ask, ask you a fact or myth type of question here. Uh, Because some of us in the dividend investment world would say that it's a fact. Monthly dividend paying stocks are better than quarterly. And some just say it's a myth and to disregard when that dividend comes in. Where do you fall with monthly paying dividend stocks or quarterly paying dividend stocks? Does it matter? Yes and no. The only one I care about is Maine. (laughs) (laughs) That's the only one I care about. But uh, um, I would say you get the same thing quarterly. You get the same thing quarterly, but I would just tell somebody like the way I got my portfolio set up, I got month by month of what's coming, you know, when I'm going to get paid. So I would just say pick some months that's going to be in January, February, March, or each month and then go down the list. But I think it's a myth. I mean, they're both good at the end of the day. I mean, they're both, you both, you still get paid. So I think it's a myth. I wouldn't say it's better. Um, I wouldn't say it's worse either, but I would say it's about the same. I think that's a myth. My opinion, I think it's a myth. Sure. I want to go back to your portfolio briefly here and ask you this question. Now, you got over 100 positions in that portfolio of yours, focused on just nine, but over 100 holdings. Mm -hmm. Why not just go into an ETF and call it a day, right? Just just set it, forget it, and keep investing into an ETF. Why even go into this business of buying individual stocks? ETF don't pay me that much dividends. That's pretty (laughs) much the reason (laughs) <laughs> that's the reason why the ETF to me, I mean, ETFs, they're good. Um, I won't say they're born or nothing like that. They can make you a lot of money, but I think ETFs focus primarily on a lot of just growth and, and which is good too. And, and I like that as well, but also too, it's like, I still want to kind of have fun over here on this side. I mean, who doesn't want to go to the club a little bit just to get a little dance on? And that's my dance <laughs> over there, you know, with the stocks, you know, with the individual stocks, you know, that's me getting my dance on. And then, you know, me coming home, you know, that's coming home to the ETFs, you knowing like, hey, I'm sleeping with the ETFs at night. Cool. But I'm going to just go dance with the stocks just a little bit. That's about it. You know, so I look at it like that. And don't get me wrong, like these ETFs have done wonders. Like they have really, like I've got some really good payouts and I've seen a lot of good growth. So I do like those too. And just as heavy as I go, with my stocks, I go heavy in the ETFs too. I just kind of keep them kind of on a down. I just don't talk to the bottom as much. I kind of just keep them in the background a bit. That's all. But I definitely still go hard with those as well too. I'd love to know now in terms of your perspective uh, for somebody who's just getting started, should they begin with an ETF? Because that, like I said, like you you loaded up on 100 positions, but you're focused on nine. Is, is an ETF a good starting point or would you recommend exactly how you started? Just throw money in there, trial and error, load up your portfolio and you'll pick it up along the way. No, nah, I, I wouldn't tell somebody to do it the way I did it because I got lucky. Um, I would say definitely get, I would say trial with just, I would say try with four, get three stocks and just get one ETF. And then from there, just watch, just watch them for a bit, watch them for a couple months, you know, and see the growth of it. So I would definitely say that. From, from my perspective, I would say, oh, I would say start with five and get two ETFs and then get three stocks and then start from there and just let it and let it grow from there. Now, would you have a good ETF recommendation? Mm, yeah, I would. I got too many, actually. Um, <laughs> I would say, obviously, uh, SCHD, um, the ProShares TDV, that's a tech, tech um stock i've got that's probably like one of my best ones um irbo um drive uh nobl 
B-Y-M, I mean, V-Y-M-I. Um, and also there's a healthcare one too. I think it's F-L-C-H, I think it is, that has a lot of all the healthcare um, stocks in that. I feel like you can't go, you just can't go wrong in healthcare. In my opinion, sure. that's what you can't do. But those would be the ones that I would recommend if I had to recommend it. And then there is a monthly one, S-P-H-D. I do rock with them too. So if you want a monthly one that's going to pay you something monthly, you can definitely go with them too. Um, it's kind of hard because all of these ones that I named, they all do something different for me, whether it's mid-size, 400 companies, large cap, you know, companies, tech, um, new age tech, or, you know, AI. So they all do something for me. That's why I got them all like that. That's why I got so many ETFs. Now tech, I mean, really, if we think about it, tech is the future and yeah, somebody the- can easily get invested into a lot of these tech companies and make a ton of money. But yet you and I are quote unquote dividend investors, which a lot of people would call, you know, boring investor. We won't really make it at the end of the day because we're not invested in enough growth. Why, why shouldn't someone go growth or why should someone at this point where you're at and where I'm at stick Mm -hmm. to dividend investing as opposed to just going a hundred percent in on growth? I think it depends on what somebody wants. I mean, me, I, I like I like income. I like to get paid. And I, I like seeing the fact that I get a raise every month. That's just me just get I get a raise once once a year at my job. <laughs> I just I just I just got a whole bunch of increases right now. I've probably gotten over 12 increases already, probably more. This this whole year so far just start off with in February of raises already from these individual stocks. So I just got more raises than probably most people did at their jobs already. That's a no brainer to me. But on the other side, I can say, well, growth too, you know, but for me, growth, I would look at growth as somebody who's looking to get around 50 and 60 and be like, all right, I'm going to go ahead and sell these. To me, that's how I look at someone that's looking at growth. Me, I look at someone who wants dividends as someone who's saying, hey, I kind of want to retire early and do that fire movement, which obviously that'd be my goal as well. So that's how I kind of look at growth. When I look at people that say they want growth, I'm looking like, okay, well, they're going to probably work till they're 65. And that's okay, too. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I'm not trying to do that. You know, if anything, I want to retire as soon as possible and be able to do exactly what I want to do in life. Um, and that's how I kind of look at dividends, too, that you can do that with. So I don't think it's nothing bad with either or. I think it's more about what someone is actually looking for. But for me, it would be more dividend and probably 10% growth or 20% growth at the moment. Let's you, let's say you you got, you know, achieved fire in the yeah. next year. What is the Andre the Titan Andre Stewart plan for the future? What is it that you're you're looking to do? What drives you to keep investing the way that you're investing? What drives me? Um seeing the growth, seeing where I came from. I think me seeing the fact that I've reached over 100k and I think seeing the impossible and then just two seeing the growth that continue to grow as well. And I think that just continues to fuel me because I know like after I reached 100K, I also pulled back on the money a bit. I said, okay, cool. I'm going to take $200 out that I was putting in. And I'm going to just use that to just kind of, you know, hang out and stuff and, you know, just do what I want to do. Sure. And up more money in. I ended up trying to find a way to put even more money in. Um, but for me, I want to say, I don't want to say it's an addiction, but it's the fact that, these companies are just paying me money and it's just hard to let this money go when I'm looking at it and I'm like, I keep buying more and all you're going to do is pay me more or give me bonuses and supplemental uh, payouts too. It's kind of hard to let that go. And sure. I think that's what it is. That just keeps me driving to just continually do more. And I think I've been doing it so long too that I'm kind of stuck in the mold where it's just like, I got to do this. So I know it's going to be hard once I reach a certain spot where it's like, hey, I kind of want to stop, but I haven't gotten there yet. And I haven't gotten to the point of giving up yet either. So I'm just barely focused. And I think I, and like I said, I think that goes back to, well, I don't want to say I got an advantage, but I think my advantage of being on the fitness side of knowing that you got to have a strong mind also helps me have a strong mind outside of fitness where whatever I'm doing, I got to stay strong and I got to keep going with it too. Because it wasn't always like this. There was a time I wanted to give up where it was just like, I don't know if I can do it, but I stay with it. And that's how I got here now. What was that feeling like when when you were in that 
I want to say moment of darkness. And it was just like, I don't want to do this anymore. I might give up. And what propelled you to keep going? It was tough. And I think the hardest part was getting over 10K. A lot of people said the hardest part getting over 100K. To me, it was 10K. I felt like I would never reach it. It was just seemed like the endless mountain. And then two, that goes back to me being a young investor for chasing yield. I didn't have any growth to help it out. So everything was pretty much reinvesting dividends and my own money being put in. And me just watching that slow growth, at one point I was just like, man, it's not even worth it. Uh, I'm done with this. Um, but I continued to put money into it. I kind of just stayed with it. And then once I reached over 10K, next 20, just the next 10 came faster. Then it started to roll a bit. But I know a lot of people say like getting 100K is the hardest part. For me, that was not the hardest part at all. That was probably, that was just as easy as, that was probably one of the, that was probably one of the easiest ones actually. Getting over 100K was probably one of the easiest. But I did have three hiccups and 10K was definitely to me, the hardest was getting over 10K. That was just the hardest. I'm not going to lie about that. Sure. No, it's very insightful because I, I agree. I think a lot of people, right, underestimate just how challenging it is to actually hit, you know, 1K, 5K, yeah. and 10K when you don't have that no. backbone to begin with. No. So you got nothing. And it's just like, is this going to work? Is it not? Once you see 10K, 20K, 30K, you know, you're at least climbing a ladder. Right. But Starts I want to, I want to ask you, Andre. Because you've said you over the three years now, you've had a couple of stocks that didn't go so hot, right? But you haven't had so many. Did you sell those positions? And if so, what is the red flag that goes up to sell? Like, how do you know when to sell a stock or it's not good for your portfolio any longer? That's a good question, too. Um, so the ones that I did have, um, I did sell and I did most of them. I did sell at a good at a good point. But what I did was... uh. Like I know I had one stock, it was I think it was IIPR. Um, I think that's like a to, a weed company. I think they deal with like cannabis. And I remember when I bought them and they was riding high. And then at one point I just start seeing them deteriorate a bit. And as I seen that that kind of started going down, and this is why I say I look at every stock in my portfolio. I know even though I got over a hundred, only the 80, only the reincurring 80 that I'm looking at to really you know, look at to see what I'm going to do with. And I'm just kind of looking at that one and it just kind of sticking out to me. I'm just like, man, this one is not really growing. They're paying dividends and they're paying more. I'm looking at their um, EPS earnings. The earnings is not looking good. They're in the hole. They're just forking out a whole bunch of money. They're, they're paying more dividends. And I'm just like, you know, I don't like this. I don't like the way this is looking. I got out on the positive side. So when I got out on the positive side, the stock actually went down even more. And I was like, bet, I got it at the right time. Also, too, um, I do have some alerts on my phone that tells me, like, hey, if this stock goes over this much, you know, I got it set to sell if it does that. But for me, I think it's more about me just researching the company, looking at EPS earnings to see what's going on with the company to find out if they're doing good or bad. And just looking at what's going on in the world, too. That's another thing. And that's kind of how I calculate what I'm going to keep and what I'm going to let go. I love that you talked about what sounds to me like macros, looking at the world and what's going on. Now, a lot of investors would share that you know macros don't really matter. I'm a huge proponent. Uh, I think you may know as, as uh, macros do, in fact, matter, not necessarily to time the market, but mm -hmm. to start to look around to see where to invest. That's how I typically use macros. I'd love to toss it over to you and ask, how are you using macros in your everyday investment strategy or when it comes down to buying or selling stocks? I didn't even know where I was really actually using macros. <laughs> I figured <laughs> I was just, I figured I was just doing what I guess I guess I I think everything that I do, I think I take it more logically as far as an approach for it rather than a decision far as like I guess as far as like a gut decision at times. Sometimes I think it's just I'm looking at the way that the world is going, just like if it's starting to get dark, of course, you're going to go inside the house. You're not going to stay outside. And I think that's the way I look at my stocks, too, is I kind of just oversee and kind of just look at everything that's going on and just looking at the businesses and just kind of seeing what's going on, seeing how the CEOs are running everything, seeing how the sales are. If everything is good, cool. If it's not good, then, you know, I see a trend in Dell. Not to say I'm just going to give up on a company because I wouldn't do that. But of course, if if I can get rid of it to get something better, you know, 
why not? And sure. I'm not going to just give up on any company like that either. But if I just feel like it's on the back end and it's been there for a while, or if I don't like the way it's trending, then yeah, I would sell it. That won't, that won't be an issue for me to do that. So three years in the making now in your fourth year, mm -hmm. looking back over the last three years, if you were to take a moment and kind of envision yourself three years ago, and you had the opportunity right now to look at yourself, you know, look back on that younger Andre and say, Hey, Andre, just do this. What yeah. piece of advice would you give that younger uh, Andre? Throw everything but the kitchen sink in there. Don't be nervous. Put, <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what it was. Because I know in the beginning, I only put like $100 in. Then it was $200, $300. Now, this is just weekly. And then eventually $1,000 a month, $2,000 a month. And now I look at it and I'm like, man, if I just started in the beginning putting at least $2,500 a month in, I'd have reached this go way much faster. And I think too, I would also tell myself too, is don't chase the high yield. I would definitely say, because I, I wasn't thinking logically in the beginning either about a lot of different stocks. I mean, I feel like, like I wasn't, like it's hard to really say where to start at because I have that same blank look where it's like, I don't know where to get in at. Like, I don't know. Like, it was like, I don't know any companies. I don't know anything. But I would just say like, you know, that's that's a hard one, but I would just say, um, man, that's a good question. I wish I could just go back and give myself these stocks I got now and be like, hey, invest in all of these. <laughs> just hold and, these. <laughs> yeah, just hold these forever. You know, if I can do that. But that's what I would tell myself. I would say, hey, think logically. And um, I would say definitely, I would say definitely take a leap of faith and put way much more money in than you did because now I look where I'm at and I'm just like, man, I could have definitely put way much more money in if I started in the beginning where I'm doing now. Now, a lot of people, I mean, I, I want to say even I might be in this category if I out myself when I first got started without a budget. If you're living budgetless, you have mm -hmm. no idea what's going on. You're sitting there saying, you know, I, I don't have any money to put into the market. You had what seems like this epiphany moment to create that calendar, understand where money's going, how much is coming in, how much is going out. What did that do for you as an investor? And how, what things did you get rid of or realize that you didn't need that you were spending money on? Um, it definitely changed. It changed my life, really, because I realized that I had way much more money and I realized I don't have to spend so much on um, eating out. I don't have to spend so much on groceries. Um, I can eat less. Um, another thing, too, is like I don't have to go buy entertainment. I don't have to like go out for uh, drinks or something like that. I don't have to, well, of course, every week or something like that. Um, I don't have to like buy a bunch of workout equipment or video games and stuff like that. So I just found myself spending money on stuff that things that I didn't need. And then two, um, when you look back at it, I, I, I really sometimes forget like, man, where was this money really going? But setting up that calendar definitely gave me a different perspective on everything. Cause it's like, you get to see all the money that's coming in. Once you see everything that's coming in, now you can take that money, minus it from your check, and boom, there you go. Now you got some extra money that you can actually invest with. And I know I hear a lot of people say, like, they don't have money to invest. I'm not a firm believer in that. You do have money to invest. If When you decide to go out to eat, don't go cook at home, take that same money, invest that. That's my opinion. you know. Or if not, get a second job if you need to, you know. If you're what if you want it bad enough, you're gonna do it and you're gonna make a way. And that's exactly what I did. And that's what that's what I would tell people. Make a make something happen, make a way, you know. Don't get out that same position. Is it hard? Yes, it's not supposed to be easy. If it's easy, you're not gonna value it. So go through that struggle. Everyone has to go through that struggle to come forth this pure gold. And I've been through the fire. And now, like I look at where I'm at now, and I'm sometimes like. Not say I can't believe I did it, but I'm just like, I actually did this. And this is amazing, you know, and it was a long journey, some dark nights too, but I got through it and I'm here and I'm even more motivated. And I would definitely like everyone else to be on the same page of being motivated because the life that everyone wants to live, you can actually live that life. You just got to take a leap of faith to do it. Yes, it's hard, but you got to go through it. I've been through it. And I look at myself as 
I'm not the smartest. I don't think I'm the smartest person. Everything I learned, I learned pure just research. Me just wanting to get out of this rat race. Me wanting to get out of what I would say, this matrix system of you work till you're 65. And when you're 65, if you can't move around, cool, boom, that's it. Then you can't really do what you want to do. That's not fun. You know, I'm willing to sacrifice five to seven years of my life order to live the rest of my life free rather than me be able to say hey only can take a vacation but only can go for uh, a weekend i gotta come back i'd rather be <laughs> that person that say hey you gotta go back i'm gonna stay a couple more days because i got the income to do that or i got the freedom to do that who doesn't want to do that you know sure. and that's the life that i want that is powerful beyond measure you know i have to say you know I if I was just speaking to you and I didn't know how much you had by what you just shared, I would easily say you might be a millionaire that I'm speaking with. Definitely a future millionaire, right? With, yeah. the, with the mindset. And, and it really is that simple. I mean, just get started and there's going to be hard times. There's going to be moments where probably you got to make a quick decision not to go out to eat or not to maybe buy, you know, X, Y, or Z that, that you really want. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the sacrifices that you made because I, I a couple of times you've mentioned, right? There were some dark nights and, and it sounds like there were just some huge sacrifices that were made. What were they? And, and how did you overcome those sacrifices? I think the sacrifices was, was like me just like, of course I like going out. I like, you know, hang. I think sacrifices me for which me sacrificing, probably hanging out with friends and stuff, seeing family and not to say like, I don't, care about my family I think that I love them dearly but for me to be like okay well I'm over 25 I've spent a lot of time with y'all I want y'all to understand that I'm on a journey right now the best thing I need is y'all support for these next couple of years you know and I think a lot of people get caught up like well, I want to do this now I want to do this now and it's like okay cool you're doing this now but what about you what about putting yourself on a track to do something and I think that's where I was at I think the dark nights came in too where it was like me feeling like I'm invested and it's like, well, I don't actually have that money to spend at the moment because it's working for itself. So it's like, man, I'm feeling a little bit more broke than usual because I just paid my bills. I just put money towards all these stocks. And I was like, I look at my pocket and it's like, I got like seven, three dollars. I mean, I got like seven dollars, <laughs> 10, 15 bucks. And it's like, I can't do nothing. You know, I got to stay at the house. But, you know, stuff like that or wanting to go out to eat or sacrificing going out to eat, sacrificing going on vacations. Um, a lot of those dark nights too, I think that kind of took a perspective. Um, also too, like if something happens, you got a big bill, you got to pay. It's like, do you take that money out your stock portfolio or do you actually be like, Hey, I'm going to just wait on that and kind of save up some money to continue to invest. So a lot of dark nights like that too. And then too, I would say dark nights of just me not knowing, cause I never really spoke to a financial advisor. So it's like, Am I doing the right thing? Am I on the right track? Am I am I am I heading in the right direction? Because right now all I see is darkness ahead. And I'm kind of just walking. And at any time I could fall inside that pit. And luckily that didn't happen. But it's like I don't know if I was even on the right track or not, you know. And then I think that's more of what it was too. And then just seeing like certain hiccups in your portfolio where the progress stops, you still put money in. And it's like, do I continue to put money in? And I and into the rest, not getting rest. Um, but like me, I actually work three jobs. I'm not even gonna lie to you. Um, I picked up two more jobs just because shoot, I want to put even more money, more even more money towards my portfolio. So, you know, I sacrificed doing that too. But I think that's more where the dark nights come at. And into is mentally tough on you too, because I mean, your brain's always going, you know, you get tired, but it's all about the race of just keep going and keep pushing. So I think that's where a lot of the dark nights came in. At. Talk about the addiction, man. Three jobs, money, <laughs> yeah, but, you, but you made it. <laughs> I know. The thing is, I don't really need these other two jobs, but I mean, I think that I'm so locked in right now that I'm just like, you know, I got it. I got to get this right now. I'm so not saying I'm close, but I'm at a point where I'm just like, it can grow by itself, but I want to even throw even more at it. I just want to continue to help it grow even more if I can. It reminds me, you know, I, I totally forgot about this until you just shared you had three jobs and 
I yeah. also looking back, I, I remember picking up another job after my full-time job for a holiday season. Not that I needed to do it. It was, but that mindset is like, just, what, just keep, keep going. going, make more, put more in. Yep. And, you know, to that, to that end, I want to ask you now that you're on the other side of this, you got the hundred plus K and you're mm -hmm. going to continue to build and you have your processes down. What would you share life is like now? Like, what's the feeling like now? Are you a little bit more relaxed knowing that you at least got the hundred down? Yeah, I'm going to say I'm more relaxed. Definitely more relaxed. I would say I'm more motivated. Honestly, I think it's like it went to another level where it's just like, I want, it's like, yeah, it's just more of, I, not say more of an addiction, but it's like I'm just even more motivated now and just seeing too, like, seeing a portfolio grow for by itself, like just seeing it explode by itself and just kind of just growth on its own just makes me want to just fuel it even more. But it definitely feels good to be on this side. And then two, there are times too where I'm just like, hey, you know what? I'm a, I'm not gonna put money in this week. I'm gonna do this instead. You know, so there is sacrifice where it's like now it's like I feel more comfortable. It's like, okay, I feel good going out and spending a little bit more money because I got that. Hey, I can actually tip more because I got that. I can do a little bit more, I can help out more. Like at my job, um, I give them, you know, I I'll I buy food like every other month now. And I feel comfortable doing it because it's like, okay. I'm financially good. I know it sounds crazy, but it feels good to be like, I'm taken care of that I can do that. I don't have to worry anymore. I think that's more it is. Like less worries for me. It's like I'm at a point where it's just like I can do stuff and actually not look in my pockets and be like, man, this is hurting. I think that's more of what it that feels so good about it. Or I can help family out if someone needs something. I can give out a little bit more to help people out. And that feels good too to be able to do something like that. So I think that's where it's at now. Um, the mindset does change having a hundred K too. You feel a little different. So of course you just got to um, continue to just stay focused because it's easy to just look at that money and be like, or like, I don't like <laughs> one time I walk. <laughs> but like, like one time I remember I walked inside Best Buy and I was just looking around. I said, man, I could buy everything in here if I wanted to, you know? <laughs> and it feels, it feels good to know that, to just be like, man, you know, I can, I can buy this, that, this, that, you know, it feels good to just be able to know that, but you know, you still gotta, you gotta stay focused and realize like continue to keep that money growing. Don't, don't take it out. Let it, let it still continue to work, but it feels good to know that you can pretty much, if not to say I can afford anything, but it's like, I can pretty much buy anything if I really, really wanted to, which is an amazing feeling. And I like that. I hope that's the motivation for everybody out there who doesn't yet have a hundred K and if you're not there yet, go for go to Andre for the advice, for the inspiration. Andre the Titan, man, I got one more question for you. I think yeah. it's by far my favorite question I get to ask every investor who joins me on Master of the Market. It's a fun one. I get to virtually give you uh, $10,000 that I don't actually give out. But I'd okay. love to know if I were to give you that 10K, Andre, where would you invest that 10K? What stock would it be? Why? And what would be your, your go-to move there with it? SCHD. And I got to take an ETF. I'm going to take Maine. Um, Maine has just been, man, everyone should get on on that one. They have been just amazing, man. I can't talk more about how good this company has been to me. Um, that's a monthly stock, too. Um, and also, too, uh, so I got how much I got left. So I got uh, took two. I got seven left. And I'll probably go for any one of my nine bully gang stocks. I'll take any of them. Or matter of fact, yeah, I'll take any of them. Take take Amazon out. Give me UPS. UPS is trading really low right now, and I'm just trying to load up. I'll load up on them too. But I would say that any any one of my bully gang stocks, um, May SCHD UPS, I'll rock with them. I love it. I love it, Andre. It has been a powerful hour here on Masters of the Market with you. A very inspiring story and one that I certainly admire. I hope to have you back on when you hit a million. Uh, probably within the next six months to a year, I'll give you the next goal there for yourself. Uh, <laughs> Andre, thank you for joining me on Masters of the Market and Investors. Until the next one, we will see you all there.